time now for Morning Rounds. Joining us are CBS News contributors, Dr. Holly Phillips and Dr. Tara Narula. Good morning. First up, a new study out this week could transform the way doctors prevent peanut allergies. This from the Everything You Know Is Wrong file. It turns out keeping young kids away from peanuts might be the wrong thing to do. Holly, what is this study telling us now? Yeah, this was a really impactful study. Uh, British researchers looked at about 600 babies. They were between the ages of 4 and 11 months old. And these were babies that were determined to be at high risk of developing peanut allergies uh, because they had eczema or either an egg allergy. So that put them in the high risk category. Uh, and what they did was one group avoided peanuts altogether. The other group had a little bit of peanut allergy every week. It turns out after five years, uh, peanut, uh, did I say peanut allergy? I meant peanut protein Exposure, every yeah. week, yeah. And, and what it turned out was after five years, the kids who had been exposed to peanuts had 81% fewer peanut allergies uh, than the kids who had avoided it. So this basically flies in the face of the recommendations that had been put out 15 years ago. They were then rescinded in 2008, but we had told parents avoid peanuts early on for your kids to prevent allergies and now it turns out that it seems the opposite is more effective. But is the takeaway then limited exposure when they're younger or what should parents do? Right, it's extremely confusing and as Holly said in 2008 the recommendations really weren't for or against it. So this study really provides compelling evidence and it's a great research study but in order to change our practice we typically need more than one study and we need studies that look at broader more generalized populations. That being said the authors and others sort of suggests that if you're low risk, which 80 to 90 percent of kids are, meaning you don't have eczema, you don't have other food allergies, it's probably safe to introduce peanut protein in the form of peanut butter as soon as you start weaning your child. If you're high risk, meaning you have eczema or food allergies, then you want to see a pediatrician or allergist to have a skin prick test, which would determine then if you could be introduced either under medical supervision or could be introduced on your own. Holly, this study is looking at a way to prevent allergies, but you looked at a treatment that actually some are calling a cure. That's right, Anthony. It's a complete game changer. Every three minutes in the U.S., someone visits an emergency room with a potentially life-threatening allergic reaction to food. Now, one doctor is trying to change that with a revolutionary approach. I'm so excited. We're ready? We're I'm excited. excited too. Okay. Yeah. For most of 11-year-old Lindsay Aaron Price's life, food has been a source of fear. The most microscopic exposure to many types of nuts could cause her to have a lethal allergic reaction. Every speck of nut, not just that she would eat, but even the cross-contamination from dishes and pots and pans and other people's kitchens were her cyanide. But that's changing. For the last eight months, Lindsay has been receiving an experimental treatment called oral immunotherapy. It's part of a clinical trial at Stanford University, led by immunologist and researcher Dr. Kari Nadeau. Yeah. We want to give you lots of choices, right? Yeah. Just like your friends are doing without allergies. Bit by bit, her body's being trained to no longer react to foods she's allergic to, a process called desensitization. Tell me how you treat allergies. What we do is to try to take away people's allergies and try to do it permanently. In order to do that, though, you have to give someone back the same food that they're allergic to. We're going pink on band-aids. <laughs> At the start of the treatment, Dr. Nadeau and her team give most patients a series of injections to lower the body's immune response. Several weeks later, they start eating just a few grains of the foods they're allergic to. Over the course of about six months to a year, that amount has steadily increased. I was nervous, but the thing was, I saw how tiny the nut flakes were, and then like, I literally said one, two, three, and then I ate it. Now, Lindsay can eat 60 nuts in one day without having a reaction. So how effective is this, and really, what's the next step? You know, this has been unbelievably effective. Really, Dr. Nadeau has, has changed the landscape of how food allergies are going to be treated. Uh, she's already treated 700 patients. 300 more are in clinical trials. And her group at Stanford is now in the process of expanding both nationally and internationally to try and spread this, this treatment protocol uh, you know, broader. One in 13 children right now has food allergies. So we can make a really big difference. Wow, one in 13. That's a surprising number. Huge. Thank you, Holly. Well, also in food news, two new studies explore how some of us may be addicted to our favorite snacks. The research suggests certain types of food may attract people the same way as heroin 
or cocaine. That's kind of, I mean, that's a little hard to believe. <laughs> we all want to believe it, but are there certain foods that really ring the bell louder than others? Uh, Vanita, not surprisingly, these are foods that are high in fat, it's sugar. It's everything I eat. <laughs> <laughs> it's Anthony's entire diet. <laughs> but fat, sugar, and refined carbohydrates. Uh, you know, things like pizza, cookies, chips, I mean, and, and that makes sense. How often have we heard anyone say, I haven't just this undying addiction to, you know, mm -hmm. raw Swiss chard. We don't hear that much. Right. <laughs> uh, but importantly, all of it, except for Anthony, he's got that addiction too. All of these foods have a high glycemic load, mm -hmm. which is a measure in part of how quickly and intensely the foods change our blood sugar. That's important because we know in animal studies, um, that can have the same effect on the brain as some types of drugs. It affects dopamine. It's not the same as drug addiction, but similar. Oh, okay. Okay, well, so, so you're not calling me a drug addict is what you're saying. <laughs> not yet, I, no. Well, Tara, how close is food addiction to drug addiction? Right, so technically food addiction is not a designated medical term. We don't really have it as a diagnosis. Right. Uh, we don't know if it changes the brain or rewires it or damages it in the same way that drug addiction does. That being said, we know that food can activate the same pleasure reward pathways in the brain that drugs do. And the best data we have comes from animals where we really see addictive behaviors in animals who are exposed to things like double stuffed Oreo cookies or sugar where they can exist it binge eating tolerance right. withdrawal uh it's interesting yeah <laughs> i like the part where you're saying it's not my fault okay <laughs> moving on there's new hope for sufferers of chronic fatigue syndrome a new study uncovered the best evidence yet that the syndrome is a biological illness not a psychological disorder this comes on the heels of a recent report calling for a new diagnosis criteria Tar Tara, many of us have heard of chronic fatigue syndrome syndrome what exactly is it yeah, it's very misunderstood and it's been reported to affect as many as two and a half million Americans, more women than men, usually in their 20s to 40s. And the Institute of Medicine did release this new report that actually recommended changing the name to systemic exertion intolerance disease. And essentially the criteria are fatigue that's prolonged for over six months, uh, exhaustion to really minimal exertion, mental or physical, cognitive impairment, and sleep disturbances. Well, all right. Well, that's good news, but I'm still getting over this food addiction thing. No, now I have an excuse. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Kelly Phillips, Karen Arula, thank, thank you both you. so much. Great to be here.